I want you to be able to have those notes. Uh, I really hope that uh, by having the notes, uh, you'll be able to ask more questions and interact. I know a lot of times when we get to taking notes, it's easy sometimes to, to be thinking and writing at the same time. And so I hope this will be a help to you uh, as we go through this. And uh, if you have your Bible and you want to open up, we're going to be in the book of Matthew. Uh, I don't know if you uh, have this question asked to you a lot, but uh, people will ask you a lot of times about uh, where do you go to church? Uh, what kind of church do you go to? Uh, why would you go to church? Uh, what's the point of church? And uh, I have uh, had a lot of conversations here lately. Uh, with people who have asked that very same thing. And uh, I'll ask them, where do you go? Well, we don't go anywhere. And then I'll say something like, well, tell me about your relationship with the Lord. Well, it's, it's mine and it's private, and that's all there is to it. Uh, I've been doing some research this week about uh, the amount of people who are now no longer identifying uh, with churches. They have a relationship of some sort, they say, with God, yet their faith is uh, private. And so. I know what you're saying, Jake. We've all been in church forever. We know all these answers. Well, what I hope to do is to, to give us a chance to talk back and forth about things that we like, that we've seen done well, uh, things that have not gone well, uh, as we try to encourage people um, who are believers and who have fallen out of church for whatever reason or who have begin to devalue the significance of church. And so we're going to just build upon this every week for I don't know how long, honestly. And, uh, and, uh, and so I want to just kind of share with you tonight as we get started uh, what we believe um, as Baptists about the church. Um, if you were to look through the New Testament for the word church, you wouldn't find it. Uh, you would find out uh, called out ones, the called out people of God. And so uh, I just want to read this to you tonight. It's from the Baptist Faith and Message. Uh, and then I want to just go through Scripture and really give us an opportunity to, one, know what the church is, to what the church should be doing, and how we can do it better, and how we can really be the church God wants us to be. And so if you got one of those packets, uh, we're just going to be starting. And it says, The New Testament Church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an autonomous local congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ, governed by His laws, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by His word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. Each congregation operates under the lordship of Christ throughout through democratic processes. In such a congregation, each member is responsible and accountable to Christ as Lord. Its scriptural offices are pastors and deacons. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by scripture. The New Testament speaks also of the church as the body of Christ which includes all the redeemed of all the ages, believers from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And so that is a general overview of what the church is in our belief and opinion. And depending on how you were raised, that might be extremely difficult. If you were raised in a Lutheran church or a Methodist church or an Episcopalian church, uh, you would have seen something very different. You would not have seen the local church as a local autonomous church. It would have answered probably to a bishop, uh, to a group of leaders, and they would have told you uh, what to do on certain things. They might not have owned their own building. It might have been owned uh, by a larger uh, church collective. Uh, you would see different things there. Uh, for instance, uh, at this church, um, if you choose to fire a pastor or hire one, only you, the members, get that vote. Uh, no one can call and say, well, you've had Jake for 10 years, and that's longer than anyone should have to suffer, and we're going to move him somewhere else and move someone else in, as, for instance, the Methodist church does. 
And so it really does matter what you believe as a church and what you believe the church should be doing because anytime you're a part of something, if it matters to you, you should want to make sure that it's going the right direction. All of us should really have an invested interest in the church that we are a part of, the church that we worship with, the church that we fellowship with. Why? Because the Bible talks about God blessing His church and blessing His people. And so for me and, and my family, I want my children to grow up in a church that honors God, that God can bless. You say, well, Jake, I don't have little children at home. Well, then you need to recognize that you are at a stage of life where you are to be pouring in to other people. You say, well, I've got my raise. It's not my problem anymore. That's not how the Christian faith works. Those who are older, more mature, should be teaching those who are coming along. And so when we see this, this statement here, and there's a lot there, and we're not going to get through very little of it tonight, but I want to just show you some of these basic things and give you an opportunity to share, ask questions, thoughts, disagreements, and we'll jump right in. And so the first question that I have been praying about in this study is, who does the church belong to? Who is the one who builds the church? If you own your home or the bank owns your home, there is a note that it belongs to someone. It belongs to them. It belongs to you. If you purchase a car, you have a car title, which you own or the bank has. And so when we think about the church, there's a lot of emotions that come up. Because most of us tie the church to a building, the building that we were raised in. And I'm not one of those people that hates church buildings, that, that thinks that church buildings are terrible. I, I'm not. I, I think church buildings are wonderful tools. They are, should be uh, treated well, and it should be something that's special, uh, and that you should enjoy and have fond memories of a church building. But who does it belong to? You have all probably been in church long enough to know that there are certain people in certain churches who think it is theirs. Great-grandpa donated the land. Great-grandma played the organ. Aunt, whatever her name is, you know, was the head of the underwater basket weaving committee, you know. I, you know, and, and it goes on and on and on. And, and honestly, you can go into many churches and you can go to a pew and it will literally have what on the side of it? A name in memory of. The worst I have ever seen, and I am telling you, it should never happen is when you walk in and the Lord's Supper table says, in remembrance of me, and right under it, in memory of whoever it is. <laughs> That's just for me, that is the biggest pet peeve that I have. And so because, then it becomes ours. It becomes something we can't change. We have been the ones that have paid for it. We have been the ones that have done it, and so it is ours. But what does it say here in Matthew chapter 16 about the church, about the called out people of God? He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, the earth will be loosed in heaven. I want you to go there in verse 18, and it literally says, Jesus is talking and he says, I will build my church. It's his. He is the owner. He is the builder. It is his. And so no matter what our view of our church is, whether you love it, whether you're kind of mediocre about it, whether you don't like it, it is his. And so when we start thinking about things that belong to God, if we love God, it should be special to us. Something that is important to my wife should be special to me. And so as we begin to think about his church and that it's him who is building it, what does that do to us? It should set us free. 
in the sense that this is not my responsibility to build it. This does not depend on my abilities. God can bless and grow his church even if I'm not the gifted, most gifted preacher. That God can bless and work even if I'm not the next Billy Graham, if, if I'm not the next uh, Adrian Rogers, if I'm not these superstars that church history remembers forever, that truly if I will just be faithful and be who God wants me to be, even though I have limitations and faults and failures, that God will build His church. And so that should open us up to say, I'm willing to serve. I'm willing to try something I've never done. I'm willing to volunteer in an area that terrifies me because I recognize that God can build His church even through my weaknesses, even through my fears and doubts. And so I just want to ask you this question. Uh, what is some examples of positives that you have seen from growing up in church and, and what you view about your church? And what are some of the negatives that you have seen uh, in church that people who can become too possessive, too uh, overbearing maybe? Why do you think that is? It's the change. You've got the people that thrive on change and the people that avoid change and scatter them in between. Do you think it's just the change or do you think it's a fear of commitment for some people? And it could be that. There's always the monetary side of it too. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're building a church from scratch, so it's a huge endeavor. Absolutely. I had a person one time say, uh, I would love to be more involved and I think I would like to join but I'm afraid I'm going to get asked to help with the building. So we were building this gymnasium right here. It had some skills um, construction-wise. And his thought was, I literally cannot be gone another night or two a week to work on that building with all that I have going on in my life. And so that fear of sacrifice worried him. Other thoughts? It may very could very well could be, yes. Did he end up joining the church? They did not end up joining, actually. They did not. So they ended up finding somewhere else to call home. I think the positive would be seeing the families follow Jesus Christ. Mm hmm But the negative would be people complain over the change process or such thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but yes, family legacies can be a beautiful thing in a church, right? Where you can see generations of people. But on the same side of that, it can become the thing that destroys a church, right? Because almost every small church that I've ever been a part of or seen is usually made up by one big family. And that can be a wonderful blessing, but it can be a terrible burden because family drama doesn't get left at home. It becomes the church's drama. And so seven brothers are all deacons in the same church. And you got the, the great aunt's the piano player and grandma's the song leader. And, and so all of it affects everything. Other things. And it becomes a sense of ownership, isn't it? This is the way. Well, it's, it's what I prefer over I'm here to worship God. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What are, what are we bringing for God, not for ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with preferences at all. I mean, you're entitled to, to your thoughts and feelings, and God made you to like certain things and me to like certain things. But yes, it really is difficult when it becomes this is my. Right? It's my worship service. It's my Sunday school class. It's, it's my parking spot. It's, it's, it's mine. And that becomes very dangerous. But also on the flip side of that, it's good when people have ownership. Right? They, they feel like they belong, that it matters. That, you know, I, I say this a lot. We attended a church one time, uh, and I had a sibling that was killed, and the money that was raised at his funeral was used to buy the gym floor. Uh, seemed like a great idea at the time. Uh, 
you know, and it still is being used, but sometimes I drive by and think I wish that wouldn't have been spent there. But that's just my fleshly opinion, you know. But it is what it is. And so why? Because it becomes mine, right? It became ours. And that's a, a very unhealthy thing, but it can be a very healthy thing. When people say, hey, this is my the class I'm teaching in Vacation Bible School, and I'm going to pray about it, I'm going to prepare for it, and I'm going to get ready about it because God's given me these kids, and I'm, I'm going to pour into them. The same way in Sunday school, these are the kids God's given me, and I've been blessed to teach this class, and, and so I'm really going to take an ownership in it. I, I really want to do it well. And so once again, we see two sides of the same coin. One can be very bad, and one can be very good. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I really want... other churches. And other churches. Other churches. (laughs) Not anymore. Those pews have been gone. Those are chairs. They're not 30 years old. But I really want to say this because really every problem that we have in church begins when the main focus no longer is the main focus. That it becomes mine instead of his. And that is so important tonight because as you talk to people, whether you know this or not, a large majority of people are unhappy about where they go to church. You will hear more negative about people's church than you will the positive. I would say 90% of the conversations I have with people, not, not you all, right, are negative don't like this. The sermon's not good. The preaching's not good. And there's, and that's not bad. I, I don't mind having those conversations with people because I try to encourage them. Uh, sometimes I just look at them and be like, Yeah, he didn't even shake my hand. Yeah. Huh? That's very true. That's very true. But I also think, though, that for many, many years, we've not given people an opportunity to even talk about things to have open discussion, to have open dialogue, because what would happen if I told Grandma that she should have stopped playing the piano 10 years ago? I mean, literally, can't even read the notes, can't hear the music, but by golly, she gives it an A-plus for effort. I don't want to tell Grandma to get off the piano, but how do you balance that for what's right and what's best, but yet dealing with people's feelings and situations? And so sometimes that means... It might not be the way I would do it, but it's not a deal breaker. It's not my church. It's his church. Uh, But yet, on the other hand, I love when people say, I love my church. I love that. And most people don't claim it as ownership, right, that it's theirs, but that they belong there. I love my family. God has given them to me, and I have the privilege of of being the head of my household, I think. And... um, (laughs) Uh, but, but they're really God's. They're God's gift to me. And that's how we view the church. We're just stewards of what God has given us. And we want to be faithful with that. The second thing I want to show you as uh, we're going through these verses, and these are actually the list of verses below this article in the Baptist Faith and Message. So if you say, Jake, you picked these verses because you don't like us, that's not it at all. You can find those verses and go verse by verse through them. But how do we handle problems in the church as God builds? Because if God is the owner and God begins to build, uh, there will be problems. Not the builder. It's not the builder's problem. But if you've ever built anything and you've ordered lumber, you when you get a 2 by 4 out that's 8, 12, uh, or 10 feet, you always look down it to see how straight it is. And if you've ever ordered lumber for Lowe's, you know half of it's going back. It's crooked, it's warped, it's not right. And so many times we look at the church and think the problems are with the builder. And the problem is not with the builder. The problem is with the material that he's using. Like the Bible talks and the good old songs talk about the potter and the clay. 
And so I really want you to see this, that as God builds, we need to expect problems to occur. But yet, if you were to look at a Lowe's lumber order and to bring it to your house, you would be foolish just to continue to build without inspecting. Right? You would literally finish that project and think, that's not supposed to look like that. I do not want a curve in my hallway. I want a straight hallway. But yet, in the church, we view it as a problem to try to deal with problems. We view it as that we're broken that we're not perfect, that, that we shouldn't have these things. Well, God gave us the remedy to check the straightness of a board, uh, the ability to check the material that we're using, and we would be foolish not to use it. And so as God builds His church, and I really hope that you will really view this in the lens of Ten Mile. I don't want to try to fix the Methodist church, the Lutheran church, the Presbyterian, other Baptist churches. That's not my calling. My calling is to shepherd this congregation. And so how do we handle problems as God builds? Uh, we have started uh, the building program over here on the lean-to this week. And right off the bat, uh, we have found out that the sewer line and the water line is exactly where a foundation is supposed to be put. Right off the bat. It's like we didn't think we were going to have to build on that side of the building again. And so they had to spend the first day uh, rerouting, am I correct? Am I saying that route? Putting in different uh, stuff. And we found out that our gas line's not big enough. And so they've got to run a whole brand new gas line, am I right? From the highway, a $20,000 deal because we don't have enough gas to take care of the needs now. And, and uh, I said, if you would have been here on taco night, you'd have, yeah, never mind. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, and those things happen. And it would have been amazing if we have said, you know what, I know we don't have enough gas for the new building and we ain't going to be able to heat it, heat it in the winter, but you know what, just do it anyway. Don't worry about it. We don't need it. We don't need plumbing, you know. It's not a big deal on Sunday morning if 600 people are trying to go to the bathroom and nothing flushes. Not a big deal. We ain't got time to address the issue out here. Just keep on building. And you're looking at me going, Jake, that is the stupidest thing I ever heard. But most churches that grow get in trouble for this one simple premise. All they want to do is grow, and they don't want to deal with the defects as they grow. They just want to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they won't fix the problems as it builds. And so look what it says here in Matthew 18. You know these verses. You've heard me quote them thousands of times over the last decade. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if you will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of one or two, or excuse me, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen, and tax collector. Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So literally, he tells us when your brother, when a fellow believer, when a fellow believer in the church, and if you know anything about the church as it was being started in the book of Acts, they didn't have First Baptist, Second Baptist, Third Baptist, Second Methodist, First Methodist. It was one local congregation. And those local congregations met in small groups. They didn't have a lot of opportunity to gather all together, but they did. And so the idea of, well, I don't like the pastor of Ten Mile, I'll just go to First Baptist. But I don't like the pastor of First Baptist, or maybe I'll switch it up a little and try the General Baptist. Well, I don't like the General Baptist, maybe I'll switch it up and try the Methodist. I don't like the Methodist preacher, maybe we'll switch it up. And I don't know what else kind of church we have in town. Well, the Congregational Christian Church. I don't like the Congregational Christian Church, I think I'll try the non-denominational church. And so we're, instead of fixing the issues that we have as we grow, and as God tries to build us and put us together, we rob that opportunity to see what God can do. 
what is the wonderful thing about a carpenter, a really skilled carpenter, is as they build, you think, that don't look right. I mean, how's that ever going to look like what I want it to look? And then when they hand you the keys, it's like, wow. You took all that lumber that came in piles from Lowe's, sent half of it back, and built a home that I can live in. And if you've ever built a new home or bought a home and remodeled it, the goal is to get it to where you want it to be. And yet we rob what God is wanting us to do because we will not deal with the problems as God is growing us. And so tonight I really want us to become a church that recognizes we will have problems. I will have problems with you. You will have problems with me. But yet God has given us the answer for how to rectify those problems. If the, if the contractors who are building our addition would have come in and said, Hey, Jake, uh, we've got a plumbing problem. I could have not helped them. If they'd have come in and said, Jake, we have a gas problem. I'd have said, take a Tums. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I have no building knowledge at all. I could not have helped them. But if they'd have walked in and said, hey, Jake, the plumbing's in a bad spot, the water's in a bad spot, and the gas isn't going to work, even though we've got you started, we're quitting. It's just too much problem. We're going to go start our next house that we need to build. What we have done? We've been like, holy cow. What are we going to do now? But yet, if they're willing to fix it, they're willing to work through it, they're willing to talk to us and say, hey, this is going to happen, and this is going to happen, eventually, Lord willing, we will have a finished product that we can use, that will honor God, that can be used for His glory. Why? Even though problems arise, problems don't have to define a church. Problems don't have to define a believer. Problems don't have to define a person. Thoughts? With uh, you know, the opportunity that, that God gave us to correct those problems, if we don't, we end up in one of the seven churches in preparation category into the letter of the <coughs> Absolutely. The the Absolutely. 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 Other thoughts? Is it hot in here or is it just me? I want to check the air conditioner. Okay. Did that on purpose, didn't you? Well, and the, the thing is this. You say, Jake, why are you talking to us about this? Well, one, because it's in the study. But two, who do you think is going to love their church enough? to be willing to fight through it, to fix it. I'm sure it's the Christmas and Easter people, right? They're the ones that are going to give and serve and sacrifice. That's them, right? They're the answer to fix the church's problems. No, probably not. Huh? Well, that works then. That works then, yeah. <laughs> it's probably not even the people that attend church somewhat regularly on Sunday morning. It's probably not going to be them. It's probably not even going to be the people that are here on Sunday morning and in Sunday school. Do you know who it's going to take to really get involved and to get serious and to get focused? Probably the group of people that I'm talking to. I mean, it's a Wednesday night in July and you're at church. And so I really want to encourage you to remember that. Third thing I want to show you tonight, and it's just questions that I have been asking and hopefully you will ask what does the church look like when it is working like it should? So God is the owner. God is building. God is working us through our difficulties. He is perfecting and fixing and correcting. So what will a church look like when it's working like it should? Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Now I'm going to stop there because I just want to walk you through this. People who are born again truly born again uh, will want to be baptized at some point. Now there are a lot of things that hinder people from being baptized. There's a fear of being in front of people. There's a, a fear of water, uh, a fear of the commitment, all of those things. But at some point, those who are being saved, being born again, recognize the significance of water baptism, the outward sign 
of what has taken place inside. You cannot be a member of this church without being baptized. Now, you can be a member in spirit in the sense that I have been saved. I'd like to join this church. But that membership does not happen until you are baptized. Now, if you've been baptized in another church, you don't have to be baptized again here if it was by immersion. But baptism is that outward sign of identifying with the Lord and his church. And so you see here, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. When we do not let God deal with the problems and brokenness and situations in church, we are hindering, we are grieving what God is doing. And so what we see here is a church that begins to receive the word, uh, people's lives are being changed. People are being saved. People are being baptized. There is spiritual life. When God builds a church, he does some through addition in the sense that there are people who are saved, who are born again, who are brought in through baptism, and some who are transferred, transplanted. And I've heard pastors say, well, I don't believe a church should grow by people from coming somewhere else. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I've been in churches before where I was starving on the vine, where I could not worship because of whatever was going on. And so I believe that God leads people, moves people uh, uh, in in churches, out of churches, and, and, and it's okay. It's all right when people say, I don't feel like I can worship here anymore, or I think I'd like to try to worship here. That is fine. I believe that. So all of us at some point have went to church somewhere else. It's just the way it is. And so we see there that addition happens, a transfer happens. And it goes on and says, now what happens after people are saved? And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, being taught the word of God. God's word has to be the foundation of a church. And we know at this point the New Testament was not completed. All right, at this point in the book of Acts, the New Testament letters, have most of them, have not been written. If not all of them have not, none of them have been written at this point, to be honest with you. And so they're studying the Old Testament scriptures, they're hearing from God, and the Word of God is being taught to God's people. Now, I understand that Wednesday night Bible studies are not the most lively events, right? I know it's not as fun as vacation Bible school. I know it's not as fun as church camp. I know it's not as fun as children's church. I know it's not as fun as jam. I know it's not as fun. But yet, all right, the word of God being taught should be central in our homes. It should be central to us as believers. Because when God truly begins to work in people's lives, they begin to get hungry. It's just the way it is. When I do physical activity, I begin to get hungry. It's just the way it goes. Now, not usually right after I'm done being physically active because I'm usually thinking, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. There's no way I can eat right now. But as soon as that feeling passes, I'm thinking, I need some food. I'm hungry. Why? Because the body runs on a fuel source. And the Bible literally tells us uh, that it's the word of God, that we should be uh, worried about the, the meaty things. And, and Paul says you're still on the milk, right? You ought to be dealing with deeper things and bigger things and, 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 and all of these things. And so I really want to encourage you tonight to make the Word of God priority in your life, whether it is a private Bible study time, whether it is Bible study, whether it is Sunday school. And I know what you're saying. You're like, well, we're all in those things. Why are you talking to them ab about us? Well, I say that tonight because it is you who will be talking to other people. It's you who will be inviting people. Hey, I'd love for you to come and go to Sunday school with me. Excuse me. Hey, I love to go get coffee on Wednesday mornings at 7 o'clock. You want to go with me and study the Bible together as we drink coffee and eat bacon? I mean, who doesn't want to drink coffee and eat bacon and study the Bible? I mean, that is the combination made in heaven. And so uh, that's literally, thankfully we're not Jews because the bacon wouldn't be on the table. But uh, uh, praise the Lord for that. But, uh, or the New Testament, by the way. So um, but anyway, but I really want to encourage you because there are only so many relationships that I can have with people. There are so many opportunities. But you, as God's word changes your life, you can tell people that it is so important 
that the study of God's word has changed our marriage. The study of God's word has changed us as parents. The the study of God's word has, has changed who I am as a person. And that is used as a building block for what comes next. Thoughts, questions? I know you already know this, but just take this and teach it to someone else. And it goes on and it says, then the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Now, I know that Baptists get a bad rap for loving fried chicken and dessert. All right? I'm not a great big fried chicken fan. I mean, I won't turn it down, but it's not my favorite, okay? Um, but fellowship, it's not just uh, what we think about. In the early church, they literally broke bread together, they ate together, they spent time together, and they literally lived life together. If you're familiar, many of these individuals who, when they got saved in Jerusalem, couldn't go home because the life that they were going home to was not the life that they had left. They wouldn't have been welcomed in. They wouldn't have been welcomed back. They would have, uh, some of them would have lost their significant others, their spouses. They would have, I mean, their lives would have changed. And so fellowship in the early church was even more significant than it is today because most of us are not going to be thrown out of our house because we got saved born again. Most of us are not going to get kicked out of our house because we became a Baptist instead of a Catholic. We became a, a, a Presbyterian instead of a, a Methodist. That's probably not going to happen in most cases. But fellowship should be important to us. The building of relationships. And you say, Jake, I just come to church and leave. I don't have any friends. I saw a study uh, this week that 42% of people who leave a church leave because they did not feel like they had any friends at that church. And I thought, well, that's, that's stupid. That's way too high. I mean, literally, how do you go to church and not have any friends? And then I just started sitting down and going through the attendance list. And I thought, well, this person comes to Wednesday night during TMU, and I've never seen anyone sit next to them. Well, these people come on Wednesday night. Now all of you that come on Wednesday nights during TMU will be looking around going, I'm sitting with someone else tonight because Jake's keeping track. I am. And... Uh, <laughs> Well, that person, well, they always sit together. They, they never sit with anybody else. Or they, and, and, and I'm not saying that to be critical. Please don't think that. That's not my intent tonight. But there are genuinely new people that are here every week. There are genuinely people who are here almost every week for the beginning. And they just don't have relationships. They don't feel like they belong. They don't feel like anyone cares about them. And that is the responsibility of you. To build with not each. You can't be friends with everybody. But you can build relationships with people. So every Friday, most Fridays, myself, my babe Crane, and two other individuals eat lunch or breakfast together. We just do. We like food. And our wives like to get rid of us. So we go and we eat together. Pretty much every Friday if somebody's not sick or in the hospital and with the crew that I've been hanging out with, that's been a lot here lately. Uh, <laughs> You hang out with older people. You know, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Dave. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, Kathy. So uh, you're looking at me like, don't call us old. But uh, I'm the linchpin that holds it together. I know. I've not lost my spot. No. Uh, and so I'm naturally closer to them than I am a lot of people that come to church here. On Wednesday nights, when you're here and I'm here and we get to talk and, and fellowship, I'm going to know you better than I'm going to know many people in this church. That doesn't mean I love you more than them. It doesn't mean that I care about you more than them. It just means that we're going to have a better relationship. And so I always tell people, if you want to be a part of the church, just show up. Show up. Be here. Be a part of things. You'll eventually get to know people. Some of them you won't want to know. Some of them you will want to know. And that's just the way it is. Not all of us are good fits for each other, but fellowship is so important. And relationships are so important. It goes on and says, in the breaking of bread and in prayer. And so we know that this can mean fellowship meals. We know that it can mean the Lord's Supper taking the Lord's Supper together, and in prayers. And I think this is the one that we struggle with the most. Because most of us hate to pray out loud. We hate to pray when other people can hear us, which that's what out loud means, I know, but I'm just being specific. Um, most of us don't mind saying, hey, Bill, I'd love to pray for you. You're on my prayer list. 
that's not a big deal. That doesn't bother us. But if, if Bill was to walk up and say, Jake, I want you to pray for me right now, I'd be like, oh. I'm the pastor of this church, but I still go, oh, oh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I'd love to, but it's like, oh, what's wrong with that guy? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> He's a little bit more spiritual than the rest of us. <laughs> love you, Bill. I don't take that the wrong way. Uh, but that's how we are. But yet it says here that they were praying together. If you've ever prayed with somebody, it will change your relationship with them. It, whether it's in a marriage, whether it's in a, a Bible study where you pray together at a table. That's why a lot of times during prayer meeting we split up at the last and pray together. Because genuinely you hear people's hearts and their requests. And I always get a kick out of it. Uh, I'll, you'll be talking to someone like this and it's like, hey, it's great. Would you bless the food? And they begin to pray and it sounds like there's a steeple in their throat, right? Well, O thou Lord, thank you for your... What is that? Never pray long before dinner, okay? Simple rule to live by. And I'll tell you how much I like to listen to people pray. If you have ever ate with me somewhere, I have probably not been willing to bless the food. It's not because I have a problem blessing the food, all right? I'm all for blessing fooding in it. But I love to hear people pray. I love to. And some of you are thinking... Well, that no good scoundrel. It's true. If I eat with you, I'm probably not going to pray, even if you try to make me. I'll just close my head and pray quietly, and I'll eat without you. That's not a problem. But I love to hear people pray. You say, well, you're not supposed to be listening. You're supposed to be praying too. I know, but still, that's the way it goes sometimes. Because why? I believe there's something special when we pray. And I believe there's something special when we pray with other people. And so I want to encourage you. Find someone to pray with. Now, you say, well, I'm going to do my husband. I'm going to pray with my wife. Now, you can do that. But I want to encourage you to find one person that you pray with that you don't live with. Once a week. Uh, maybe it's before church. Hey, we're going to pray for our Sunday school teacher. We're going to sneak into this Sunday school room before our class gets there, and we're going to pray for our teacher together. That's simple. And I'm telling you, it will change your relationship with that person. Thoughts, questions, disagreements. scares me.
I think we missed that in a small community because we most most of us got more family that we could even keep up with. Right. And yeah. so. When I first came, we were we were very heavy. We did a lot of fellowship, and then as we grew, the pendulum swung the other way, where it was always Bible study, always Sunday night church, always you know, always, always, always. And now we're trying to swing swing the pendulum pendulum back the other way with the Wednesday night fellowships, the Wednesday night meal, the Sunday school parties. We're trying to find that whatever that healthy balance, because it is because. Uh, the one question that we get the most from people, and the one complaint we get the most from people is, so you guys got a spare directory laying around here? Well, the one we got was from when I had one kid, but you're welcome to have it. <laughs> Literally, and I had one chin at that point in the game. I'll tell you my secret about that. You have your wife take attendance, and she's my directory. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's very true. And if Jake walks through, I grab him. Yeah, yeah. Last thing, last thing. Um, praising in that verse. We should be praising God, and you will see God give us favor with people. But the last question, question how does God keep the church on track? So we build it. It has problems. God fixes them. It begins to work like it should. But how does God keep the church from going astray? Because if you know anything about any organization, it will always drift. It will always drift. Satan's greatest weapon, I think, for the church is to get our eyes on other things, even good things, that draws our focus away. And so Acts chapter 5, uh, you're familiar with this story probably, uh, what has happened, and you can flip over there with me really quickly, and we're going to try to take care of all this in less than five minutes. But in Acts chapter 5, uh, you're very familiar probably with the story, but I want you to get it just so you can see it. Um, in Acts chapter 5, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, right? Uh, lying to the Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord strikes them dead on the spot. And this is where we find ourselves in verse 11. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasing, increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. And uh, I think this is very important uh, when you read this because most of us think, wow, uh, that is a powerful uh, moment where God literally uh, takes these two individuals out. And naturally there's a fear and a reverence and a respect. Some of that fear was a healthy fear. Some of that would have been, oh, no, I've been lying and I don't want to get struck dead. Let's just be honest. But look what it says here in verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. We read that, we think, that's awesome, right? That's amazing. But we must not forget that the same power that removed Ananias and Sapphira from the equation is the same power that restored sight to the blind, that healed the sick, the Spirit of God. And I think this is important. Because as a church, when we begin to grow and God begins to work, we begin to request what we want the Spirit to do. God, we just want you to save everybody. Well, maybe some people have hardened their heart to the point where it's God's time to remove them. And I don't mean remove them from this earth to the next life. I mean go to church somewhere else. Maybe it's they need to step away from a ministry for a season of healing. Maybe it's there's a relationship that's been that's been very damaging to you and God removes that relationship from you. Maybe you've made a relationship an idol and God removes that relationship 
for you to get back to trust him. I say this a lot, and I'm going to say it again. Please do not put your pastor on a pedestal because God will knock them off, right? If you begin to worship a man, God will remove the idol that you have worshipped. Just like in the Old Testament when the children of Israel made the golden calf. God ain't going to let that fly for very long. And so whether it's a Sunday school teacher, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a denomination, God will remove it. God will work. Just in the same awesome power that he saves, he corrects. The same power that he heals, he can destroy. The same power that gives life can take life away. And so what we see here is the Spirit of God is at work. And in some situations it is embraced. In some situations it is feared. And I really believe that if we are going to be the church that God wants us to be, we have to have a healthy fear of God. We have to have a healthy fear and reverence to God that says, you know what? God might just reach down and deal with me in the good times and in the bad. I know that's not popular, but don't miss what happens. And they were all with one accord. You know who didn't have a problem with what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Probably everybody except for Ananias and Sapphira. They probably didn't like that very much. And friends, in the church, we have to be very careful in what we celebrate and what we don't celebrate. Because sometimes when we think God is not working and it doesn't seem to be the way we would do it, God is winning us some of the greatest victories he will ever win us. He is preparing us for the greatest presence and blessings he will give us. In verse 13, Yet none of the rest dared to join them. What's that mean is they didn't have a church growth seminar. They didn't go out door to door after that. Because anybody that really didn't want to be a part of the church wasn't part of it. And that is exactly the opposite of how we do church today, isn't it? Let's make it as watered down, as seeker friendly as we can. Let's make it as just as simple as we can. No challenges, no difficulties, just as easy it is for people to come. That's our view of reaching the lost. God's was, I'm going to smite two people, and then I'm going to continue to bless. And so tonight, I really want to encourage you to be in one accord, to trust that God is the one that has to do the work in people's life. We can visit people, we can pray for people, we can be good to people, we can put roofs on houses, we can build wheelchair ramps, we can do all of these things. But friends, none of that will really bring people into the church if the Lord is not in it and the Lord is not drawing and the word Lord is not working. Because listen to what verse 14 says. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. So God has continued to save continued to work, and continued to move. And so the church was built, it was corrected, it was working, and then it was kept on track. And so that is week one of what will be many, many more weeks to come, I believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you think the hardest thing about the Lord building his church is comparing for us to want to help him do it? What is the hardest thing about letting God build his church and not trying to get in the way? It's the same thing with God following God's will in your life and not your own. Mm-hmm. You know, you, the human part of it wants to, wants to help what's not needed. Mm-hmm. For me, it's watching the success of other people. Literally, they don't put in church magazines the churches that are closing, right? Pastor's been there 37 years, not seen anybody save. Uh, church attendance went from 150 down to 17. Let's put him on a magazine. Now they put some yo-yo like Rick Warren on the cover. That's who they put on the cover. You, you, 
the way it is. Right? They put some guy like uh, James McDowell from Chicago that had all them churches. They ended up getting fired for being abusive. Those are the kind of people they put on the cover. Why? Because they are prominent, prominent and successful. Two years ago, I got the privilege of preaching in man's, eye. in man's eye. Yeah. But as a pastor, you watch that and you look at that and think, well, I want the church to grow. I want it to look like that. Two years ago, I got to preach the annual sermon for the IBSA uh, statewide association, and it was because we were a small, dwindling church, right? No, we were growing. There were people being saved, and so that's the people they want to hear from. They didn't ask what we were doing. They never asked, what's your prayer life like, Jake? They didn't know any of those things. They thought there's a church that's growing, successful, and you go this year and you see who's preaching it, it'll be the same thing. Next year, same thing. Why? Because we view that as success. And so the greatest temptation I find for our church and for us is to say they did it and it worked. We should do it. When God might be saying, huh? It's pragmatism. It is. And God might be saying, yeah. And it might be God saying, what they're building is not going to last. What I'm trying to build with you will last. 